I told you folks were so fashion forward that they rocked exaggerated bulges right on their crotches. I kid you not. The codpiece was quite the fashion statement back in the Renaissance. These padded, decorative groin enhancers weren't just a simple accessory. They were a bold exclamation of manhood, or something like that. Day to day, men strutted around with these conspicuous, bulging additions to their trousers. Codpieces were effectively the 15th century version of armored, let's just say, enhancers. They came in various shapes and sizes, ranging from subtle to outrageously exaggerated. Now, you may wonder, why on earth would anyone wear these things? Well, the Renaissance was an era of opulence and extravagance, and, like today, fashion was more than just clothing. It was a reflection of one's social status and power. You're broke! You're poor! The more elaborate your attire, the higher you appeared on the social ladder. Codpieces fit right into this mess of flamboyant style. Codpieces even found their way into suits of armor. Yes, even on the battlefield, Renaissance men wanted to flex their superior stature. This gives a small degree of realism to the popular depictions of breast armor, commonly displayed in fantasy games. Though these rely on having the entire body also covered. Goodbye, metal bikinis. But there is another reason that men of the Renaissance embraced these rather peculiar accessories. Though wearers wanted to highlight certain uh, physical attributes, codpieces also served as pockets for carrying small items. Think of them as the original fanny packs, but far less practical and far more eye-catching to the ladies. Think of it as a sack next to your sack, I suppose. The larger and higher the codpiece, the more important you seemed. It was a way for men to assert their masculinity in a time when fashion was everything. Codpieces might seem bizarre to us today, but in the Renaissance they were all the rage, and men wore them with pride. Comment below if you want to see them make a comeback. Now, let's fast forward to a fashion trend that was more painful than ridiculous. Lotus shoes tiny, ornate footwear that were more than just a fashion statement. They emerged from the painful practice of foot binding in ancient China. Why on earth would anyone willingly bind their feet into these miniature monstrosities, you may ask? Well, foot binding was more than just a fashion trend. It was a reflection of the societal norms and extreme beauty standards in ancient China which highly prized women having extremely small feet. The pain and suffering it caused were immeasurable. The practice involved binding young girls' feet tightly, preventing their natural growth. It was a brutal, years-long process that deformed their feet into small, curved lotus shapes, hence the name lotus shoes. The smaller the feet, the more attractive a woman was perceived to be. This led to the widespread belief that bound feet were not only desirable, but necessary for a woman's prospects of finding a suitable husband. The extent of this practice is staggering. It's estimated that up to 50% of Chinese women had bound feet during its peak during the Song Dynasty. The consequences were severe, extending beyond the physical deformity Women with bound feet faced a life of excruciating pain, impaired mobility, and limited independence. They couldn't walk properly or perform even the most basic daily tasks without assistance, many noble women requiring the constant attention of their servants or slaves. Historically, it's important to understand the cultural context in which this practice thrived. Ancient China was marked by deeply rooted traditions, and it's through these traditions that such extreme beauty standards were perpetuated. In a society where women's lives were heavily constrained, foot binding was just one facet of the larger system that controlled them. Now for a fashion phenomenon that led people scratching their heads in the early 20th century. 
cobble skirts. These were not the sort of skirts a modern viewer may think of. They clung to the wearer's legs like a second skin, often down to the mid-calf. They defied the flowy and voluminous styles of the past, opting for a sleek and narrow silhouette. Hobble skirts popular in the early 1900s were the embodiment of constraint, both in fashion and movements. Skirts so tight that they restricted your stride to mere inches, forcing you into a slow, awkward shuffle. Now, you might be wondering why anyone would willingly subject themselves to such sartorial torture. Well, the rise of the hobble skirt saw a departure from the rigid hoop skirts of the past, with women seeking a more streamlined, modern look. Ever willing to stay up to date with fashion, many women simply endured the garment's forced awkwardness. In a way, hobble skirts symbolized the changing roles and aspirations of women in society. But here's the catch, their inescapable status as an impractical nightmare. Everyday activities like climbing stairs, boarding a train, became a Herculean task. It was as if fashion took a detour into silently combining both physical and mental torture. Now, think back to William Shakespeare. What comes to mind? Besides the obvious, he is always depicted wearing something unusual around the neck, a ruffled collar. These extravagant neck pieces, not just accessories, but a display of constant one-upmanship, can lead a society. They were collars so outrageously oversized and stiff, a family-sized pizza could be safely rested upon them. Practicality took a back seat as these neck bands boldly announced one's social standing. Originally, a small ruffled collar around the neck, designed to hide the scars of diseases such as syphilis, they grew larger and larger with each wearer's attempts to display greater opulence. But comfort? That was a small sacrifice for the upper crust of the time. These neckbands presented a unique set of challenges. Imagine trying to eat, converse, or even turn your head with what's essentially a frilly, oversized donut around your neck. Yes, it was as awkward as it sounds. In an era where appearances spoke volumes, these intricate neck pieces not only served as status symbols, but as a symbol to the wearer's audacity. As mentioned previously, the wider your ruff, the higher your social rank. They were as cumbersome as they were esteemed, with prominent figures of the time, such as Queen Elizabeth I, playing a pivotal role in making these outlandish neckbands all the rage. As the saying goes, when in doubt, follow the Queen's style. Interestingly, these flamboyant neck pieces have occasionally reappeared in contemporary high fashion, proving that some trends do come full circle. We personally think neckbeards may benefit from these clothing articles. Similarly, powdered wigs, the curious fashion choice of 18th century Europe, were more than just elaborate headpieces. They were also a window into a world where appearances were everything. They were usually made from horsehair, human hair, or even wool doused in scented powder, typically starch-based. As it turns out, there was more to this style than meets the eye. First, hygiene was lacking during this period. Regular hair washing wasn't the norm, and wigs came to the rescue, masking not-so-pleasant odors and hair sins, as well as lice and balding. Now you know the first reason why they embraced these heady headpieces. But it wasn't just about covering up hair dilemmas. Powdered wigs became a status symbol. The bigger the wig, the higher your social rank. Yet, like all trends, powdered wigs had their era and eventually fizzled out as the 19th century rolled in, making way for practical and understated styles. Now for something more familiar, the corset. In the 19th century, the corset ruled the world of women's fashion. It was more than an undergarment. It was a tool for body transformation, promising that coveted hourglass figure. Over time, they even became outerwear, 
with many intricate designs being featured. Tight lacing was the secret sauce. Women cinched themselves into these constricting contraptions, pulled so tight that breathing seemed like a luxury. The goal was simple, achieve a waist so minuscule that Scarlett O'Hara would have been envious. However, beneath the allure of a tiny waist lay a realm of discomfort and health issues. Corsets, when laced up to the extremes, compressed the lungs, squashed organs, and wrought havoc upon digestion. But societal pressure was a formidable force, making women endure these torturous contrivances. The message was clear. Beauty required sacrifice, even if it meant sacrificing your well-being. Thankfully, we've progressed since those days, right? Cosmetic surgeon today in connection with a patient's death from a Brazilian butt lift. 